Welcome everybody. So here we are in COVID era. And uh, I think the way I'm going to handle this is I'm going to handle this as part COVID and part restorative. And uh, I'm going to say first off, thanks to Kattenbach. They're just an incredible company. They are a great uh, supporter of Catapult. They're a great supporter of education. And they're a great, just a fantastic company to work with in addition to great materials. Um, I would say the interesting part about the last six or eight weeks is I took a job. I think I needed another job, but I became the clinical director of Midway Dental. It's a disruption type uh, company in my eyes of how they want to grow the distribution world for dentistry. And what it's enabled me to see is really hundreds, if not thousands of dentists who are clients and all the confusion out there with COVID. Offices opening up for emergencies. I've been in my office now as in last Friday, um, seeing six patients and I know how challenging this whole thing with emergency appointments is. I did use aerosol, condemn me, condemn me, condemn me. Um, and I'm gonna have this open for questions. I'm not gonna leave until all the questions are answered and we got a lot of interesting things. This is definitely not gonna be just a restorative program. So I'm gonna start with the what ifs. How do we handle really geriatric emergencies? And these are the highest risk patients, we know this. And if you go to Catapult Education, I have basically 12 questions on how we do questions on COVID to our patients for emergencies right now. So what are we doing in my office? A patient calls, they've got an emergency. My front team sends them a questionnaire. My front team has been trained on how to ask them the questions about COVID. And there are 12 detailed questions and then you're gonna see the detailed geriatric questions. They then call me to go over the patient's COVID history. And this is how detailed it is. And if there's any question marks, I then call the patient. Sometimes there could be up to four calls. You could say this is overkill. I think kill is the understatement word with COVID. I, I take this incredibly seriously, incredibly. So I, I believe to minimize risk for this nasty virus is you have to be doing advanced screening questions. My screening questions are far beyond the ADAs uh, because I find them just not enough. And I, I tell you, you you're really should just download if you would like a detailed questionnaire on them. Because when we're screening geriatric patients, you all have to understand, they are from the no risk to the high risk, they are the highest risk patients. And so as a result, when we're going through our screening with them, it has to be very detailed. So in this new norm, and we have advanced screening questions, I have to know who's walking into my office before I see them. I absolutely, I won't even see a new patient right now. I have no desire to see a new patient because I don't know if I can trust a new patient because I can at least trust my current patients when we go through this because I don't want to get sick. I don't want to get my staff, my team sick. I don't want them to go home and get their family sick and I don't want to get my patients sick. So screening is absolutely imperative. So this is the screening questionnaire you can download off of our site. And if you have any problems, just email me, I'll get it to you. But first go to the site if you can. And, and it really just goes question by question. And this is why I do a lot of teledentistry. I like to talk to my people face to face. But with geriatrics, these are the additional questions, really not even on the questionnaire. So the first question is, do you live in a senior assisted living facility? I want to know. I've turned into a geriatric dentist. I started in 1984. And what happens? My 50 year old patients, they're old. And now I'm treating their kids and some of their grandkids. But I treat in a day, I could have six 80 year olds and a couple of 90 year olds easily in a day, easily. So the first question I'm going to ask is Do you live in a senior assisted living center? Do you think you'd want to know that? I think you'd want to know that. Okay, now let's say they do. So the office will need then to discuss the COVID situation at their facility. So then I'm gonna have to get in contact with the facility. 
because they're facing themselves. They may not have all the answers about what's happened at that facility. And then I, I'm going to start asking the questions. What's been the overall impact? My team had two emergencies last week from senior assisted living centers. And I had to find out how active was, what was going, was it active? Were there COVID positive patients presently there? So it turns out there were. These patients are at the highest risk. I don't want to see them. You don't want to see them. So imagine you've got an 85 year old, they've got a broken tooth, they're calling you, they've been a patient on record. Four people have died in that facility, let's say, and they don't have the answers. So I'm gonna manage that patient with antibiotics, analgesics, and I'm gonna consult with their doctors. I'm gonna bill out teledentistry, there are codes for it, and that's how I'm gonna handle it because this is how we handle COVID positive or potentially COVID positive patients. These patients want support. They wanna see your face. Their caregivers wanna to talk to you. They really, really do. And this is geriatric dentistry 2020. So what do I do? So I use, and there's so many great systems out there. I use a system that I got through Midway Dental called, called Ice Health Systems. I think it cost me 70 bucks a month. And once I downloaded the software, you can use any software you want. It's irrelevant. It works with Dentrix, Eagle Soft, Open Dental. And all I do is I go onto my Google Chrome, hit start a session. And then all I do is share the email. I basically click share email. And then I'll go to the caregiver's email and just right click and just copy and send. And what happens? I'm talking, yep, that's me just about a week ago. The hair is growing, the hair is getting a little grayer and there's Annie. And I'm gonna talk to Annie about her patient. I've gotta discuss the medical history and the COVID history and what's going on in her mouth. And I'm telling you, this is dentistry today. And I have no problem doing it. And if she has got to get me in touch with doctors, then I'll do all that also. But this is geriatric emergency dentistry right now. Let's say there are no active cases at the facility. How long has it been since their last case? Based on what they're doing in Italy, which I go by uh, as my Bible right now because they got hit so bad, Basically, they believe that the virus can last in a human body up to five weeks. And what they do is they don't even let people out of quarantine until they test double negative, negative after two weeks and negative after four or five weeks with a PCR test, not an antibody test, a PCR test, which is viral replication of the RNA. Okay, so if someone's been around anybody, by the way, Anybody who, who, if anybody who's had COVID, I am not gonna see for five weeks, absolutely. Now, after five weeks, I would do an antibody test to see if they've built up antibodies, but openly, if it's been five weeks, you can either have them go get a PCR test to confirm they're not carrying the virus, but I'm gonna do an absolute antibody test on them in my office. What about if the patient, the elderly patient is living at home? If they're living at home, are they living alone? Many of my patients live alone. If the patient's living at home with a caregiver, my team now has to ask, what's the risk factor of the caregiver? Is the caregiver taking care of other elderly people? Is the caregiver being careful as far as socially distancing? My mother's 88. She has two caregivers. They are both unbelievably careful. That makes them a low risk. If she had caregivers that were out at night or had up, going into other facilities, senior facilities, then they would be high risk. I wouldn't let them near my mother. So openly, you have to assess, is this patient high risk based on their caregiver? That's why sometimes we have to talk to their caregiver and ask our questions. It's not just the patient coming in, it's also who they're living with. If they're living with a family member, is that family member socially distancing? Are they, li are they working from home? Or what if the family member is gone during the day as an, as a transit worker? Well, now that's a high risk person.
So now I know this geriatric patient could be high risk based on the fact that they're living together. I mean, that's what you have to be asking your patients. I'm telling you, we probably spend 20 minutes screening our patients, minimum. So these patients are very, very complicated in their screenings. And then you got to get to their medical histories and comorbidities. So screening, screening, screening on geriatrics. That's part one tonight. As part of our screening, we do offer our patients antibody testing. And uh, we, we believe this is an important screening tool. So I'm working Friday and I have already talked to every one of my patients and they will all be antibody testing. They're all low to medium risk. And that's how I feel that you can go, why bother? Why bother, Lou? So if somebody comes in and you're doing an antibody test on them, so all it is is you prick their finger, drain a little blood, little blood in two little areas, and you're testing for IgM and IgG. The IgM antibody, if they have IgM, they're going right away, out the door. What does that mean? If they have IgM antibody, that means there's still, in all likelihood, a virus within that patient because the IgM antibody starts to come out day three with the day three with the virus and goes away. The latest is 28 days. IgG starts to come around 10 or 12 days later and then can last obviously months or longer. So I use the antibody test to see if my patient's active potentially and if they've got the IgM antibody, that meant they've been exposed and they've built up antibodies and Openly, I don't even know if I need a, an N95 or a KN95 mask if I'm working on them because they have the antibody and they shouldn't be infectious. But I do think if they have the IgM, they would be infectious. If they have IgM and IgG, they go home. Anything with IgM, they're going home. And I know some of you are nodding your heads and going, I'm a dentist. I know you're a dentist. I mean, you're a doctor. Get over this. And those who are saying some states won't allow it. I don't care. I'm being first up. I don't want to get sick. I don't want anybody in my office to get sick. That's why we're doing antibody testing. It cost me 30 bucks to get the antibody kits and I charge $30 copay. That's what I'm doing right now in my office, period. If a patient says to me that they don't want the antibody test and I feel there's any risk involved and they don't want it, I let them go home. I don't want to get sick. What about scheduling these emergency patients, these geriatric patients? So, first off, we really are trying to minimize seeing them right now. Illinois is still peaking. I, I don't understand how people think social distancing is not practical. It kills me. Um, and we're going to have big second and third waves. I, I guarantee it. I mean, every other country is on lockdown except this country. Not being political, I don't understand it. I want to get back to work. I just want to get back to work in the right way. I'm working. Um, but I think what you have to also look at is the prevalence of COVID in your community. In Chicago, it's very prevalent. If you're in Southern Illinois and you have one case or two cases within 30 square miles, well, openly, it's not that prevalent. And there's much less risky for you down there right now. But, you know, where is it peaking? In Minnesota and Nebraska, as of today, those would be highly prevalent areas and I'd be very, very careful. I prefer to see these patients first thing in the morning. The problem is most of them like to sleep, but my feeling is deep, deep down, your, your office is the cleanest when you open it. And if, if it's the cleanest when you open it, that's when I wanna see my high risk patients. That's how I feel. And so if I have a geriatric patient, I had one last week and she goes, I don't like to get up that early. I go, too bad, and I wanna see you. And that's what we did. So, Screening, that's how I look at it. Testing, that's how I look at it. Now I'm gonna talk oral disinfection. And oral disinfection becomes critical. And I'm gonna challenge everybody out there. I'm gonna challenge everybody out there. And let's go with it. Oral disinfection, rinsing. What do you use? Does it matter? Should everyone be rinsing? I have been telling, I've been teaching this for now seven or eight years, pre-rinsing. I want to minimize bacteremias in my patients. So anybody before COVID that was medically compromised or we're doing surgery on, we're pre-rinsing. 
period. Why? I want to, I want to minimize bacteremias in the blood supply. Well, now I want to disinfect the mouth. So when you look at disinfecting the mouth, what does the ADA say? The ADA says have patients rinse 1% hydrogen peroxide before appointment. Okay. Is that for five seconds? Is that for five hours? What, what, what is that? So it's very interesting because I'm very aggressive in understanding directions. That direction tells me rinse for how long? Does it matter? It does matter. So I went on to YouTube, which we all do, and I wanted to hear what the ADA was talking about with mouth rinses. And the woman talking, she was great. Pamela was great. And she said, there's been very few research studies on pre-rinsing, pre-rinsing that reduces disease transmission. And there are no CDC guidelines for pre-rinsing to reduce disease transmission. Yet hydrogen peroxide is a great disinfectant. But where are the studies in all this? So just for you to know, if you want your patients to have what I call a quality alcohol-free hydrogen peroxide rinse, here are two from the two big manufacturers in dentistry. P&G makes Crest 3D white and it's glamorous white. So obviously the hydrogen peroxide is gonna bleach your teeth. Colgate makes peroxol. Now, obviously, there are other uses for hydrogen peroxide, but these are the kind that you can buy in the larger sizes for your office and have it at a minimum, the patient rinse their mouth for one minute. One minute, not 20 seconds, one minute. It's a long time. Now, does that disinfect the mouth? And there are questions whether hydrogen peroxide in a rinse can truly disinfect the mouth. So I think it's an option, and I think these are two great rinses, and maybe at home, but we go one more deep. What if we could really disinfect the internal mucosa? Because that's the initial point where COVID hits. So let me explain this so everybody understands this. Okay. COVID comes really through you touching your nose or your mouth. It's really how it enters. And where the studies have shown from SARS in 2008, COVID 2020, the cells really accumulate, I mean, the, the virus really accumulates around the epithelial cells surrounding the saliva glands in the mouth. So what happens? It comes up from, it can actually come up via the cilia from the lungs. You want to get it before it goes to the lungs. And it also drains through the nasopharynx. And this is why saliva testing for the PCR test is more accurate than sticking a nasal swab halfway up your brain. So it collects in the, around the saliva glands. So now that's the most initial point where it's growing. So you got to disinfect the mouth. If you disinfect the mouth, the chances of aerosol really being harmful are significantly less. And that's the key. So disinfect the mouth. So we have a two-step approach. I guarantee most people are not doing this, except my buddy Tony, who's listening. And it's a two-step approach with a rinse and brushing. Step one. So this is a company and it's called, the company itself makes an IO rinse. Now, they're, they come in three different ways of how they distribute it. We just use their overall professional dental mouth rinse. Now, you're going to go, Lou, why this rinse? That's okay. And I want you to ask that because Tony turned me on to this, and his hygienist turned him on to this. So, openly... What do I do? The company's in Boca Raton, Florida. I go meet the company. I go into this company and it's run by three guys. And one's a dentist, one's a researcher. I mean, it's just crazy, but they've got something so special. I think this product is the natural home run. It's molecular iodine. And it is a non-staining formula 
and it and molecular iodine is the active ingredient, the active part of iodine that is biocidal. So if you think about basically iodine, you think of betadine, where they, they basically, so when I had my neck surgery, they're going to scrub my neck before they cut me open. And basically, I want to betadine the mouth, but I want to betadine the mouth far better. Betadine has one to three parts per million of molecular iodine, which is the active ingredient. In IO rinse, it's 100 parts per million. So think of this. Think of this as literally 100, at least 30 to 100 times more powerful than betadine. So me, I want to know when I go see them, show me testing. So this testing came out years and years ago. I mean, you know, whatever, 10 years ago, eight years ago, at a laboratory, I believe it's in Montana, and they tested scope, Listerine, uh, Colgate total rinses, and none of them killed germ. None of them killed SARS. None of them. None of them killed rhinovirus. So they tested this at 25 parts per million, which is still eight to 10 times more than betadine, and 300 parts per million. So this is just what I pull up from the documents. Iodine at 25 parts per million completely inactivated rhinovirus and human coronavirus. Okay, exposure 30 seconds. We have a rinse one minute. Okay, one minute. 300 parts per million completely inactivated rhinovirus and human coronavirus. So do I think we should be rinsing with this to avoid colds? Yeah, but right now I'm trying to avoid COVID. So there's your research from an independent lab. So me, I, I am a little nerdy, so I want to go in and look at their documents and 99.99% reduction. Others had 45%, some had zero, but I don't want to show you all those slides. I just want to show you the reality. We sell the rinse. I think it's 20, 25, it costs me 12, 15, I think it's 15 bucks my price, and then I sell it to the patients for 20, 25. So after they rinse, they go, why are we rinsing? This is why that they want to buy it for home use. I know everybody wants this. They're not a sponsor tonight. I, I can only tell you this is the kind of stuff what we learn on webinars. So this is their website. Write it down. I'm not paid by them. It's iotechinternational.com. That's who we order it from. They have a rinse and they have a gel. Just letting you know. Now that's part one. One minute rinse. Now, if the patient is allergic to iodine, and they and how would you know? You'd ask, have you had the iodine contrast dye for radiation or a test? If they are, we don't use this rinse. If they say they're allergic to shellfish, which really isn't an iodine allergy, by the way, we still avoid it. So on our medical history, our COVID history, we go now, are you allergic to iodine? If so, right to the hydrogen peroxide rinse for a minute. Part two. Part two is now I want to aggressively brush. Now I'm going to bring in part two of this. You can go, is it necessary? I don't know if it's necessary. I just want to minimize any COVID. So now I'm going to disinfect with hydrogen peroxide at a 1.74%, which is what we use for PerioProtect. This is their gel. So a patient They've walked into the office, we, we measure their temperature, we do an oxygen saturation, and after we do those two with a pulse oximeter, now they're walking over to the sink. Their toothbrush is waiting, a new toothbrush. We're gonna reuse the gel. In other words, we squirt the gel on the toothbrush, boom, now they're brushing their teeth. They brush for two to three minutes and spit. This is 1.7%, it's a typical, it's known as an oral debriding agent, and obviously, it's a cleanser because that's what peroxide does. Sorry, the slides cut off on the top. Allergies, I don't think so. Lack of bacterial resistance, we love. And openly, this is why we use it in PerioProtect. It helps treat periodontal disease. It's part of our bigger system. I'll be teaching this on Midway Monday night. How we're incorporating PerioProtect in a different kind of system with PerioProtect Monday night at Midway.
And it oxygenates the pocket because what does peroxide do? It breaks down to oxygen and water. This is Perio Protect. You can buy the gel. You don't have to be working with Perio Protect with your trays. It's what I'm brushing at home with at night. You know what I'm rinsing at home with with night. You just go to perioprotect.com. They only make one gel. Okay. That's my part one. Now I want to get to what this course is about too. Restorative driven emergency dentistry. So as I get into this, I want to talk about a really innovative restorative material. And I don't really get the wows with a lot of the materials today because a lot of them, they're just a little better than somebody else. This material is really unique. Uh, we just finished a catapult review on it and it's Kettenbox by Salus Semcor. And the product itself is a very interesting product because it can be used as a core buildup and it can also be used in as an adhesive resin cement. You can cement posts with this. I mean, it's really a very universal product to the point where I think I'm gonna order less of other products so I can have just this product. And it's great for emergency dentistry. This is what it looks like. And it's really a system that can take you from rebuilding a tooth to cementation, which I'll close on when I get to my third case tonight. There are three primary components. It has a tooth primer. It has a restorative primer of how you're going to basically prime the restoration. And then the SEMCOR is the cement or the core buildup material. So there are three, really three principal components. So if you look at the SEMCOR, it's really a dual cure composite. The, the primer is a self etching Single, it's a self-etching primer with NDP, will create adhesive bonding to the tooth and it is not like cured. You're just gonna scrub it for 20 seconds. No like curing. You can etch the tooth prior. I'll show you a graph in a minute. The restorative primer, you know, again, I use a lot of primers when I'm cementing zirconia and Emacs. This is a restorative primer. It's got its silane, it's got its MDP. So this is a self-enclosed system. It does have try-in pastes. I have not used this system for veneers. I wouldn't use the system. I'm not saying you can. This to me is a, it's a crown, it's a buildup, it's a post and core system, but they actually make a try-in paste and you can use this for obviously di different, you know, obviously, if you're looking, if you've got very translucent Emacs crowns in the interior, you may want to try the try and paste as the cement comes with different colors. So I look at this as it's a post and core. It's really great for post and cores. It's great for buildups and crown cementation. It does require refrigeration before you use it. And then per what I read, it's got a six month shelf life. I go through this stuff about, I can go through a tube of this probably in two to four weeks. I think I've already done five syringes of it. What makes it kind of interesting is when you look at the sheer bond strength for a core buildup, and you look at really great core buildups like Deluxe Core Z, it's got a higher sheer bond strength. When you look at cements, it's got a higher sheer bond strength. That's what makes this so unique. When you look at it in adhesion to dent, dentin, the first graph is in, in blue is the initial, and then this is self-etched. In blue is the second, and I'm not worried about enamel, by the way. Um, I don't really deal with it when I'm doing crowns for the most part. If you etch dentin, you get a lower initial bond strength. After 5,000 cycles, it goes up. And I find this when I use Ultradent's system also. Ultradent shows the same thing. So there was a there was a thing that you shouldn't etch dentin. I, I think it really depends on the product openly. But you don't have to etch dentin here. So let's go through three cases. This is Phyllis. She's 84 years old. She comes in. Obviously, I have never put in a post like that. So I know this is not my work. And she told me I tried Gorilla Glue, but it didn't hold it in. 
her medical history. For her, she's got failing health and she is definitely failing. She had a mild stroke two years ago. She's got some long-term neurologic issues. I don't know what they are. I, don't even ask me. I don't know. She's been on Fosamax for years for osteoporosis. So this is what she came in with. This is her last periapical in 2016. And I'm a huge comb beam guy, but I, I just didn't take a scan on her. Didn't feel it was necessary. So here's the history of number 29. Here's the PA that day. No pain, no mobility. Probings are around three millimeters. And it was restored over 20 years ago. She's been a patient of mine since 2005. So I have no idea how old this crown is. But pretty impressive. And that it lasted this long. Now she's sick, doesn't feel well. It's been out now for a few months. Yet the margins are clean. She's got minimal decay, a little internally. She's got really good internal feral effect, which is important. Her external feral effect, as you can tell, is it's okay. Her occlusion was high when I tried it in because the tooth had already erupted, obviously. The contacts were amazingly excellent, which I love, so I didn't have to adjust them. And the margins were intact. So all I had to do was cement. So the question is, do I adjust before or after? I adjust after. Then you go, why? Because the, it's moving, and I don't want to adjust anything that's moving. I'd rather wait till the cement is set and do it that way. So here's my secret sauce. After I remove the decay, I micro wedge every tooth before I, when I'm working on root canal te teeth, every tooth is micro wedged. There's some great micro wedgers out there. This is AquaCare. I think it's I think it's sold through Shine. I don't even know who sells it. Um, I don't even know who I bought it from. It's a dual port. I use a 27 micron uh, alumina particle, aluminum oxide particle. So I'm going to clean the internal aspect. Why? If you if you bond into dirty dentin, you're going to get crappy bond strengths. So I always micro etch. It's micro etched with water, and it takes a few seconds. That's it. That's step one. Step two. You're gonna take the, all in the same kit, you're gonna take the primer and you're gonna paint the inside of the crown and the post. Now I've already micro etched this too. So I've micro etched obviously the preparation and I micro etched this. And I'm now gonna paint this for 60 seconds and I'm gonna air dry. And when I say air dry, I use an air only syringe. I don't use air water syringes. I use air only syringes, why? When you lift up an air water syringe and you hit air, what comes out? Water. So you aim it at your knee, your forehead, the patient's head, whatever. So I always use an air only syringe. It costs $179, get it installed. I use it day in and day out for all my bonding. So 60 seconds, you paint the inside of the post, the inside of the crown, air dry. Okay. Now I'm gonna take the tooth primer. So the tooth primer is now scrubbed for 20 seconds. And you're gonna lightly air dry with your air only syringe for 10 seconds. Now I'm gonna scrub the canal and I'm gonna scrub the external part of the tooth because I am gonna be cementing this and putting the post back. So after 20 seconds, no light curing at all, you're gonna air dry. Now you could etch, that's up to you. But again, etching is not required. No light curing. So I'm gonna tell you from our Catapult review, this, this product is getting stellar reviews. What was the biggest complaint, you ready? The bottle of the restorative primer and the bottle of the tooth primer look too similar and people got them confused. Yep, that was the biggest complaint. So they wanna change the tops. They wanna make sure the tooth primer looks different. I swear that was the complaint. Tip options. So they have a shorter tip for cementation, and then they have the endo tip, which is what I use in this case, obviously, because I'm going into the canal. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna take your tip with your Semcor and you're gonna back fill the post. I mean, the chamber, you're just gonna back fill it. What I will tell you, I don't know how Kettenbach did this, it has got the ideal film thickness. It has got the ideal film thickness. And I am really picky about film thickness. Um, they're, they're like 
their visalis core material, ideal film thickness. Rebuild up, which is a vocal build up material, ideal film thickness. Luxacore, ideal film thickness. Others are just so thick. This has got to be ideal because you're cementing also. So you inject into the canal and backfill it. Now place the crown. You can immediately see where it's high. Look how high this crown is. Okay. So you could let it self set, but I'm too bored. So what am I going to do? I'm going to tack cure it. So you tack cure on the buckle for two or three seconds and peel it. Look how that peels away. I mean, that's how easy this is. So on the buckle, you tack cure it. Then you go to the lingual and tack cure it and peel the lingual. Then after I do the buckle and lingual, I like to tack cure again interproximally, just to make sure I get that initial tack. Because sometimes I think if I don't tack cure it again, I don't know if I've cured it interproximally and I want to gently floss down. I don't want to create any bleeding because that could immediately create micro leakage. So I'm gently going to floss through, just make sure my cement is removed. And then you allow it to self cure for six minutes. I said six minutes, go out of the room, put a cotton roll in, leave the patient for six minutes. After the six minutes, I had to adjust the crown. Yep, I went right through the porcelain into metal. So is number 30, look at number 29, 28. I don't think it's a big deal, but I'd rather adjust it when the cement is fully set I won't weaken any bonds, and off she goes. Here's your final x-ray showing the post inserted. Everything looks good. Happy patient. Case two, this is Jerry. He's 76 years old, and he comes in. The first thing he says to me is, I think you made me this crown. So now what do you do? What do you do out there? What's the first thing you do if someone says that? I think you made me this crown. You know what you do. You know what you do. You look at the chart. Did I do this crown on Jerry? He's been a patient of mine since 2016. I go up and down. I did some ceramics on his front teeth, a composite. I never did this crown. Never. This crown was done by his previous dentist. That's a good emergency. I hate my own emergencies. That's my last case today. So in 2015, this was the very apical that was sent from his previous dentist. Crown looked fine. Here's his last bite wing, 2019. Everything looked fine. So what, what, what happened here? Well, this is what was interesting. So I'm going to walk you through this because I didn't take pictures. The pin was placed in the buccal canal. So what happened was the dentist left most of the gutta perch and he just put a pin in and the other post, the other post, is in the palatal canal. Okay. It's got good feral effect internally and externally. So I removed the pin and I removed, I micro etched all the cement out. So I removed the pin and now I remove the cement. So at that point, I micro etched the entire inside with a 15, 50 micron because it's a little coarser so I could remove the cement. And then I place the restorative primer for 60 seconds. This is ready to go. I created a new post chamber. So I went in, created a new post chamber, fitted a new post in, shortened the new post occlusally so it would fit into the existing crown. Then I cleaned the new post. Okay. I primed the post. And then basically, then I micro etched the two canals. So I created a new chamber, cleaned the post, and you can use like an Ivo clean or a Zer clean to clean them. And then I'm going to prime it with the restorative primer, period. And then what did I do? I injected, I injected the Semcor into the canal, put the post in. Then after loading the post, I loaded the cement in the crown and I put the crown in. I tack cured from the buckle, lingual, then the interproximal and removed the excess cement. So in one emergency appointment, I put a new post in, bonded the canal, put a new post in, new core buildup and a cement.
that's how unique this material really is. This is Vlad, he'll be our last patient. So he came in and told me his crown came out when he was having soup. Don't you love that crap? Oh, I was having soup. No, I don't think so. Well, this is a crown I did two years earlier. Brian's unbelievably won't wear a night guard, fractured his tooth on the buckle, the occlusal and the lingual, and there's some core buildup in there. Great but it was the soup. This is his clinical picture. You can see I don't have a lot of tooth there. He did not want to go through the process of rebuilding the tooth. So it was my crown two years earlier, first molar occlusion, missing second molar, grinds and doesn't wear a night guard. I love being a dentist. So I re-cemented the crown with a full adhesive system, okay? Bonded the tooth. Bonded the inside. You could have used Semcor. I didn't in this case. Don't know why, but I didn't. Um, and then what happens? Three months later, the crown debinds and he lost it. Great. So that's what he comes in with now. Margins are clean, obviously. Retention, it's terrible. External feral effect is questionable. Contacts are good. Yeah, contacts were great on the previous crown. Occlusion is first molar only, it's, and the root canal had been done, no issues on the root canal. So I'm going to walk you through what we do. I micro etch the tooth chamber just like I showed you. So I'm going to micro etch with my 27 micron alumina oxide. So I'm going to have a clean canal and chamber. I try in the post. I've now prepped the canal. Now I'm cleaning with Ivo Cleaner Zerclean for 20 seconds. I will clean by Ivoclar, Zerclean by Bisco. I'm gonna rinse, I'm gonna air dry it, and there's my air syringe. So you're gonna rinse it off, and you go, why are you cleaning the post? Because it's been contaminated. There may be some saliva on it. Don't rinse it off, clean the post, air dry. Now I'm gonna place the restorative primer directly on the post. Oh yeah, because we're bonding to the post. So I'm gonna place the primer for 60 seconds. My assistant's doing this. I'm just taking pictures. She's gonna stroke it and then she'll air, and then she'll just air dry it. Again, air only, no light curing. The restorative primer, you could etch or not etch. We applied it for 20 seconds, all inside the chamber, inside the canal and externally. Anywhere where you want the SEMCOR, you want to scrub for 20 seconds. Air dry, lightly to heavy, five seconds light, five seconds heavy. Air only, no water. The canal, not a yip, the canal tip was placed as deeply as possible within the canal. Okay, so I'm going to backfill the palatal canal and place my post. As I do that, I tack here the post. But what I love about Semcor is it doesn't flow everywhere. So after I tack here the post in place, then I'll add more material around it, tack here it just to fix it in place. So you can add layer upon layer. And what my key is, is just keep your tip always in the material. As you're extruding the canal, just keep your tip in the material. You let it sit for six minutes so i put a bite block in and i'll go bug tony down down the hall margination so i'm i'm picky the older i get the slower i get i'm picky so i do my initial preparation with my routine diamonds and these are from show food dental i use two of them i'll show you what they are i believe if you have fine finished margins versus coarse margins your ultimate crown fits better so this is from Shofu, and I order 836V1 and 839V1. That's it, rounded shoulders, they make a great kit, this is all I buy. It's the robot series, I don't know, they probably last me a month each. Use them for all my preps, ground preps. Final curing. Again, now, this is just, again, critical. So I prepped, and now I'm gonna to wanna to do my final curing. To me, the light that walks the, 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 the Velo Grand still to me, superior light. I like the Grand because it's larger, 
larger head encompasses the entire preparation here. Up here, 30 seconds rotating my light, buccal, lingual, and occlusal. Make sure fully cured. Obviously, it's a self cure already happened in the six minutes. I'm still light curing when I'm done for conversion. So here's my final prep. And that's what it looks like when you use these beautiful Shofu burrs. But I think what's really important here is look at look at that core material. You're not going to see voids, preps like Denton, and that's why I take the picture. And to finish this, all, all I'm going to then do is, like where Tony uses lasers, I'm still a typical retraction guy, and I love lasers, but I use it for more gingival procedures, um, and I'm still a double packing core guy. So here's a triple zero that's already been placed first from ultra-dense cord system. Then I use a viscostat light or viscostat clear over the triple zero. And then I place a one or a two cord for lateral displacement. This is, before I take my itero scan, I'm telling you, this is the glue. This is what works. So what happens is that second cord has got to laterally displace the tissue. And if you let it sit there for five minutes while the patient's biting down, on one of these great traccident retraction caps that are scalloped. These are made by Premier. You wait five minutes, take out the cap, rinse the area, pull out that first cord, leave the original cord in. And that, that cord, that, that tissue stays retracted for minutes, minutes. So there's no bleeding and there's no stress. And finally, I'll just show you two little things as I close this. Uh, he didn't have a temporary. So I, I love 3M's Pro Temp. Uh, they make a great kit. And I, you know, when I, when they don't have a crown in, this is what I use. So it comes obviously preformed. You warm it up in your hand, you place it on the tooth, you can use some scissors to basically scallop it. I place it in, light cure it, take it out, and I reline mine. So this is a Pro Temp crown relined, as you can tell internally. And again, you have to light cure these for 60 seconds if you read the instructions. That's what a pro temp crown needs, 60 seconds to achieve final hardness. So here's the temporary crown in place, buccolingual, and final time for pictures. Now, why would I do this? And I'm showing you this camera. So I've had Canon 10Ds, 20Ds, 40Ds, 800Ds. This is without a doubt my favorite intraoral camera. And in COVID times, I think this is going to become the must-have in most practices. So the, to begin with, it's a touchpad. So now I'm going to take photos now that I've completed the preparation. And it's a touchpad on the back. Nobody's ever created a touchpad. You can scribble on the screen with a stylus to make notes, color map, anything you want for the lab. But the most important part, you can disinfect this camera. You can't disinfect a Canon 10D, a 20D, or a Nikon, whatever. You can disinfect this camera. It's water resistant. And if you're going to tell me you've never picked up a camera with dirty gloves, you're lying. It's like you've never touched your loops with a dirty glove. So I use this camera religiously. We wipe it down in between patients. It has different modes on it. And I don't use most of the modes. I use three modes. I use a standard mode for standard coloring, isolation mode to take out the pink, and I use a face mode when I'm doing bigger work and I need to look at their face. But this is the kind of color you get. So on the left or the pink is their standard mode. On the right is their isolated mode. My lab loves these pictures because you can see the chroma. You can see, you can see so much with, these, with this camera. The final delivery, well, sadly, I did this, I did everything the first week in March, then COVID hit. So I'll be delivering him with Vitsala Semcor. Why? Because I'll have done the post and core and now the cement with one monolithic material. So that's what I'll be cementing with. And I think that will give me the longest longevity with this patient. I invite you to join me in my new norm shows. We bring these to you via midway 
our catapult education these are the two websites that host them we've done almost 30 series this week we just did gary katie next week we've got a great lineup and it's just really great i just get to talk to all the experts in the industry and as i close tonight and i'll take plenty of questions i'm not going anywhere my motto is to everybody out there and i do get sentimental be safe and be smart you got to be smart out there, everybody. You do. This is my personal email. If you have questions, you can email me here. I will turn this over now and I'm going to answer some questions. Can chlorhexidine be used for a rinse? Absolutely not. Chlorhexidine has been and don't I love the questions. Chlorhexidine is useless. So it is a antibacterial. It has no viral effect. We use no chlorhexidine in our office anymore. So if you're using chlorhexidine, get rid of it. It is only antibacterial. And so Christina, there's your pearl for the night. Do you re-rinse after each cough? Well, we let them do a post-rinse before they leave unless I've extracted a tooth. If I've extracted a tooth and they're biting on gauze, then no. But openly, if they're coughing, I'm trying to minimize coughing, but there are some thoughts that we should do a, a during a procedure rinse. But if you've got an isolate, a dry shield, a rubber dam, are you kidding me? You're not gonna do that. So I'm not worried about that. Okay, next question, I love these. Do you have air, infil air filtration in your office? So this is what we're doing, and I'm exhausted with this whole thing. So on filtration, we are actually buying a system out of Ireland called Navaris. It is sold through Midway. It kills the COVID virus. Now they are backlogged. So what I am doing openly is I have our HVAC company coming in and installing in a UV system. So we will have our entire heating air conditioning ducts also working with us. So I'm going at this two ways. I'm going at this in the operatories and in my HVAC. Do I take this seriously? I don't want to get this. I don't want to pass this. You all can say I'm being overly cautious. So be it. That's how I am. And I do believe in the filtration system. The next question, closest for pre-rinse. Okay, closest. Jerry, openly, I no longer use closest in my office. It's a chlorine dioxide that once you open it, it becomes inactive after so many weeks or maybe a month. If you like chlorine dioxide, Jerry, use Oracare. Oracare is an activated chlorine dioxide made by a dental company. I We have that in our office for normal pre-rinsing before COVID. So we no longer use closest. We did about six or seven years ago. Now we use a product called Oracare. Would I use Oracare to pre-rinse the mouth for COVID? I've asked them, do they have studies? They do not currently have studies. So I am using my IO rinse. It's an easy thing, okay? Um, question, Dr. Graham, would you be able to describe your approach regarding emergency treatment for pregnant women? I don't think I would change anything for pregnant women. I mean, I, I mean, I just don't think I change anything for it. I mean, obviously, if they're in a first term, that's the most, you know, the first trimester, I want to avoid that. But honestly, if they're in second or third trimester, I'm going to treat them pretty much normal and I'm still going to screen them. Um, the question is, have I been able to get PPE? So many things are on back order. Don't I freaking know it? Um, through Midway, I just got KN95 masks. And I will tell you, and, and, and again, I tell you all the truth, the KN95s, you know, there's all this hoopla over N95s, which I can't get, fit testing, and right now we're in a transition mode. So hate me for this. This is what we did with our KN95s, they're great masks, they're from China. And so what we did is we bought elastics, elastics from Amazon, and the elastics come in different strengths and basically notches. And so that makes them really, really tight. So I think when you get your KNs, you gotta tighten those loops. So you go to Amazon and you buy these elastics. So yes, you can, but you can go through Midway and get K95 masks that have been 
through FDA and whatever. They're definitely really good masks. Okay. Sorry, I, I'm not going to rush. There are great questions. For case one, are you concerned with the prognosis of the root canal due to bacterial leakage? Joanna, absolutely. Joanna, here's what I'm going to tell you. I've been doing dentistry for 35 years. Routinely, I will take a comb beam, and I'm a huge Prexion guy. And I would normally do that. And if I see a problem, doesn't mean there's an active problem, I'll note it. She's 84 years old and in bad health. Am I going to redo the root canal, redo the post, and redo the crown on her? Or with her neuralgia and having a stroke, coming in in a wheelchair, I'm going to take care of this patient as best as I can. Of course, I'm concerned about it. It's been in 20 years. And if that turns into a problem, that's so noted in a chart. You're absolutely right. Let me go to the next one. Sorry. Just great questions. I love this. For your two-step pre-rinse procedure, do you have the patient spit into the sink with the toothbrushing step? Doesn't this create unnecessary risk? They basically drool it out. That's what they do. Alyssa, that's a good point, but they've already pre-rinsed and now they're just drooling it out. I really don't let them spit it out. They just drool it out and wipe it in their mouth with a napkin. Um, that's how we're doing it. Uh, let's go to the next one. How is it we are listed as the highest risk profession by the CDC and we do not have priority for PPE along with the frontline responders to protect our risk population like geriatric patients we are discussing tonight? Where is the petition signing to Congress to give us access? We did it for PPO loans, why not PPE? So here's what I'll say, Peter, you're talking to the right guy. I actually wrote the governor of Illinois, sent him a letter why, why dentists should be doing COVID testing in their offices because we were all unemployed. I mean, I've been unemployed for two months. And I would say this to you, I do believe PPE should be going to our frontline. I, I do feel the, for the last two months it has been frontline. I do feel it's time we get PPE. That's all I can say. I can't have a hygienist work in my office until we have the right PPE because they're just at risk. Is it possible for a patient to have active virus even with the IgG antibody? Okay, Mark, that's a great question. So there's still a lot of unknown. We don't know if the IgG is even creates immunity. South Korea, they thought patients were getting secondarily infected. Turns out the study showed that it was week four between week four and week five, not week 10 and 12. So the virus had not gone away in about 160 South Korean patients. So what I'll say is, is I don't believe if the Ig antibody is in their mouth and it's been four or five weeks since their symptoms have disappeared, I do not believe the virus is active. That's my feeling right now. I could be wrong next week because the next study will come out. But right now, I'm waiting four or five weeks before I see any COVID patient and it's four or five weeks after their symptoms have disappeared and I'm doing an antibody testing. Not a question now, but to commend you for your on-time info. Oh, thank you so much. That's so nice. Um, thank you for all these nice things you're saying. What is the antibody test you use? Okay, so openly, I am right now doing research with Midway. I'm finding you the best antibody test. Midway is currently selling a test the first one they bought, they actually are not using. It's amazing how, how they walk to walk. We found out the effectiveness was just too, too erratic. I gotta have accurate testing. So if you mail me, email me, I don't have the name. I bought it from Midway, my current test, and we're looking at a few more tests right now. Everything we're looking at has a sensitivity above 85%. So yes, you will have some false negatives. But that's why we have to screen our patients. Um, what is the percentage of iodine rinse you're using? It's 100 parts per million. They make a concentrate, I believe, with 300 parts per million that you can put in a water pick or your oral irrigation when we're doing scaling and planings and, you know, in your oral irrigation in your offices. So they do make a higher concentration. So we have that in the office also but the percent is based on parts per million. Um, 
So the COVID test, you got to go through midway. Um, you say you leave room. You say you leave the room and wait six minutes for the sem cure to self cure. What about in today's environment? Would you just sit in the room? Mark, I love that question. Mark, I'm not going anywhere. So Mark asked a great question. Do you really get up out of the room today in COVID times? No. I sit there. I don't bring my phone in the room, Mark. It's a great question. I sit there and I'm bored to death. That's the honest to God truth. Openly, Mark, I'm not going to do recall exams. I'm going to be meeting my hygienists. They're going to be using all my diagnostics. I'm going to go over every recall patient in my morning huddle, tell them what's, what we need, whether we need carry view, a cone beam, I don't take full mouth series anymore, bite wings, whatever tests I need. And then I will be talking with my hygienist at lunch and then before I go home. And if we have any findings, then I will tell a dentistry the patient and then they'll make a visit. So Mark, I am not getting up and leaving the room. No, not at all. Okay, I believe that is the end of your questions. So I just wanna say thank you all. You know I love doing this and I share all your passion for being dentists and whoever else you are out there. Have a great night, bye-bye.